The book of Jude is a small little book, but it sure punk packs a punch. <laughs> There's a lot in here. This has uh, 25 verses. That's 613 words. You can read it. Alexander Scorby reads it in under five minutes. Let's say that you read half the speed of Scorby. Ten minutes. <laughs> you waste ten minutes ordering something at the restaurant or the McDonald's or wherever you go. Now, I say ten minutes. But what's going to happen is if you start reading this book, it's going to say, hey, whoa, you didn't know about this. Or, hey, I just told you about something you never even heard of. And I'm assuming that you already know it. And you're going to slow down and you're going to say, wait a minute, what's he talking about? And then it may take you months to get through the book. <laughs> it's one of those type books. The theme of the book is contending for the faith. Uh, Jude is the... Um, Gen this book has a general um, description of what's going to happen in the end times. Now, it's already beginning to happen now, but it's going to accelerate. Once we get out of here, there's no, um, you know, we're a, we don't think of it this way, but we are. Christians, there's a lot of Christians on this earth. There really are. And when we're gone, there's a whole lot of devilment on this earth. <laughs> I mean, literally. And so the tide's going to turn, and it's going to turn fast. Now, this book uh, is not so much Jude speaking as it is the constraining spirit. Look at verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you. <clears throat> well, he started off with, I wanted to write you, but then a need popped up. Needful from me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So Jude's going to tell us about uh, things that happen in the spirit realm. He's going to give you the insight into what's going on in the demonic world. And this you don't want to delve into just out of curiosity. You want to do it based on Bible, what God has to say about it and learn where your stance is, what you're supposed to know and not supposed to know. If it's revealed in Scripture, you're supposed to know it. If you go down to the palm reader, you're not supposed to know it. <laughs> Jude 1, look at verse 6. The angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So he's going to reveal the reason for the destruction of the world by a flood. Then he's also going to talk about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by fire. God's two main ways of uh, final judgment, water and fire. In verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. How many cities were there? Five. Death giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Uh, fornication never has a good connotation. <laughs> it's connected right there with hell. So that, that's a, that should be a normal thing that comes up in preachers' messages. <laughs> it used to be. Yes. should still be. The same perversion that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be going on in the tribulation. And it's probably already maybe starting to begin. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, look at verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. A flood. 38. Well, a lot more connected to it than just water. Verse 38. For as in the days that it were before, for as it, uh, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Okay, they're eating and drinking and buying and selling. Those aren't Christians. <laughs> now I know there's not any Christians in the tribulation, but in the tribulation, a believer won't be able to buy and sell. <laughs> Now, I don't know at what point that, that becomes a mandate. We know it does by the Great Tribulation. That's a definite thing they, they have. It probably gives them a little bit of a, a, a get-to-know-me honeymoon period in the beginning. 
and probably not the whole three and a half years of the beginning either because we see he comes in as peace and then it slowly changes real quick in fact we got it right here what follows peace what follows peace is um, hell a red horse that's blood so peace doesn't last too long <laughs> the honeymoon gets over real quick Look at Luke 17. Luke 17, 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they did drink, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came, came and destroyed them all. Not the ones in the ark, but the ones who weren't. 20, 28. Likewise also, as in the days of Lot. So there's another connection. They did eat, they did drink, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. They thought they were in for good times. Trump's going to bring in peace. <laughs> the second coming of Trump is going to reset righteousness in the world. That's the message that the ultra right is preaching right now. I don't know if you hear it, but if you get on the right channels, that's what they're saying. Uh, verse 29. But the same day that Lot went uh, out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he, shall be upon, uh, he, uh, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field... Let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife? <laughs> the author of this book is, of course, Jude. Jude is a shortened version of Judas. Jude is also a derivative of Judah. Uh, all that Jude. Uh, Jude here is the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and, the, and uh, brother to James. He says so in, in our passage. But let's find him where he was as an apostle. Luke 6, verse 16. Luke 6, verse 16. Here's our writer. And Judas, the brother of James. That's the writer of our book. And Judas Iscariot, which was also the traitor. So there was two Judes in there, two Judases. One was good and one was not. <laughs> Acts 1, verse 13. Acts 1, 13. Here's a good verse to memorize. <laughs> seems, like a, it seems like one of those odd verses. But every now and then you'll need something like this. Like we need it tonight to find out who James is. Acts 1.13 And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. So James and Jude have the same father and mother and their brothers. The audience he writes to is the common man because he writes of the common salvation. Uh, look at it in verse 3, Jude 1, 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, he said, I'm not giving you some theology degree. I wanted to write to you about just the common salvation. Um, in Mark 12, Mark 12, I'm going to show you something about this common salvation. Mark 12, verse 37. Jesus speaking, he says, David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. He just gave them a riddle. Common man should have said, man, that's, that's scholarly, I'm out of here. But no, the common man receives it. Common salvation does not necessarily mean everything is very simple and elementary. It means you, the honest person recognizes truth from his creator 
and he's intrigued by it. That's what a common man will do. Now, if you're not a common man, you're a proud man. You think you got all the answers. And you don't want to hear everything else is below you. Okay, the common man is intrigued by the word of God. 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16, verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, be strong. You've got to be a wimp in order to say that verse applies to you. You don't walk up to Arnold Schwarzenegger and say, hey, you need to be strong. <laughs> okay? We should recognize, as Christians, we're wimps. We're weaklings. And our job is to take the warning here. We need to be strong. Okay, so we go to where strength is. Our strength made perfect in weakness. When I'm weak, he's strong. Okay, there we go. Say, uh, 2 Corinthians 13. Second Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that, Christ, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. He says, he's in you, prove it. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of proof amongst most Christians that he's in there. <laughs> prove it. Work it out, he says in another place. Colossians 1, 23. Colossians 1, 23. If you continue in faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am a minister. Now that's, that's the common salvation. From the beginning of the Bible to the end, the most common thing about salvation, regardless of dispensation, is there's hope. There's hope in the end. That's the common salvation. Every dispensation, that's the message that's preached. Hang on, God's going to fix things. It's going to be right. <laughs> don't, don't deny him. Don't, you know, go along with what he's saying. Do what he says. Because he's going to fix everything and you want to be on his team when it ends. <laughs> that's the common commonality of all salvation. Look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Okay, common salvation wasn't good enough for them. They wanted something a little more highbrow. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now sometimes somebody doesn't get off track just by going out to become a Satanist. They get involved in a seducing spirit. God wants you to be Filthy rich. That sounds good. It'll seduce you. It's a seducing spirit. Next step, doctrine of devils. Mm. Here's how they do it, verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meat, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. I had to get my windshield replaced today. And uh, so I went to, what was that place? Um, Lloyd's. Lloyd's got me some steaks. That's <laughs> what a man's supposed to eat is meat. Now, there's more to that. When the devil sees meat, it automatically triggers in his mind the spiritual picture. Meat is simply a picture of something. It's a picture of discernment, according to Hebrews. So when he sees that, he does not want people to have discernment because he's a deceiver. So let's even kick out the picture. What's the picture of marriage? Marriage is simply a picture of Christ uniting with the church like a marriage. So he says, no, no, we ain't having that. <laughs> Look at it in verse 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be, refu if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So that's a commonality of all salvation. The word of God, you read the Bible and you pray. If you'll read the Bible, you'll soon be praying whether you realized it or not. 
you'll read it and he'll say hey boy I, I saw what you did over there and you oh I'm so sorry I won't help me never do that again okay see that it's just automatic <laughs> or you'll be reading along and he'll say something and you say whoa I've never seen anything like that are you sure you've meant that <laughs> see you, you start a conversation with him that's the great thing about this book you have access to the author okay let's move on the enemy in our book in Jude this spiritual war is to be waged against evil doctrines and false prophets that's what's going to show up in the latter times false prophets not less religion more religion the devil didn't show up to Eve in the garden and say let's get rid of religion you be you you, you go out and do whatever you want no he said let me make you just like God will make you more religious Revelation 18 Revelation 18 23 and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee for thy merchants were the great men of the earth for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived it's going to become satanic it's going to be um, a the next level of what people call karma <laughs> do good deeds and you get good deeds okay well that may or may not be true but it's not based on the universe repaying you it's based on God and his mercy that's what it's based on <laughs> but you start attributing it to these supernatural um, energy sources and that's where it's all going you know we got to get away from coal and go to green energy <laughs> so <laughs> it's all going to be some supernatural energy force that's where we're heading the artillery we're going to use in this warfare of course is going to be exposing the doctrine of the devil and the false prophets you got to expose them Revelation 6 verse 9 Revelation 6 verse 9 now the way this gets exposed is not by the celebrity Christian doesn't mean much that's just a smooth talker that's somebody everybody worships the world's got that too the way it gets exposed is by common ordinary Joe the common man that's the one that exposes it and that's the one that matters because when just your buddy shows up and says hey look the Bible says that's wrong look right here and he doesn't say Billy Graham taught me okay well then it's you think well hey I'm just as smart as he is maybe I need to look at that <laughs> okay that's where it matters the common man he says in Revelation 6 verse 9 and when he had opened the fifth seal I saw unto the altar the souls of them, them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held common man can do some uncommon things with an uncommon book the word of God now if you'll stand on that word of God that's how you'll be known it's gonna be your testimony you're a walking Bible I've had several people say if you got that whole Bible memorized I wish <laughs> just because I know five verses is more than most <laughs> and some of those I don't even quote right <laughs> Revelation 12 Revelation 12 verse 11 they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death Whew. that's really standing behind what you believe when you're willing to die for it ask most Christians what they're willing to die for it sure ain't going to church because most of them drop that as soon as a, a, a flu bug came out <laughs> I, I mean what is it where's the line <laughs> I don't know Revelation 12 look at verse 17 and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ commandments that is find something to obey well you don't have to look very hard <laughs> you should read the Bible and God will point it out to you real quick now I'm not saying it's 
it's the Ten Commandments. Everybody knows those, and no, none of us do those. And then you do some of them. That's good. But the commandments I'm talking about are the everyday commandments. He'll give you some commandments that nobody else will see. It won't have anything to do with anybody else but you. And to you, it'll be a commandment. And you obey that commandment. And you'll get the testimony of Jesus Christ. Other people will notice it. Jude, look at verse 20. Jude, verse 20. It said, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So it's very important to pray. Now the charismatics make too big a deal about prayer. All they want to do is speak they don't want to hear God speak. Okay, well, there's a balance to it. But don't kick out one that's just as imbalanced as the other. <laughs> he says to pray always. Doesn't mean you have to have your arms folded and, you, you know, your hands folded or whatever and sitting with your legs cross-legged. There's no posture. It's a conversation. You and God are always having a conversation. Look at verse 22. And if some have compassion, making a difference. That's how you're going to expose false doctrine. One way is by compassion. You say, hey, yeah, I understand where, you, where you're getting that from, but let me show you there's some more verses on it. Compassion. You didn't just wake up as spiritual as you are right now. <laughs> Somebody had to have a little patience with you. Compassion. But not everybody. Look at verse 23. And others save with fear. You need to scare them to death. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Some people can only wake up when you say, there's a fire in your building. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody. Some people, that they'll think you're just crying wolf because you've done it so many times. Other thing is if you're not getting through, switch tactics. Now, the first thing to do is ask God what you should do. But we're so stupid, sometimes we don't understand when he's telling us something. <laughs> so if it's not breaking through, try the other, switch it up. <laughs> Throw them off their game. If they expect you to be hard on them, be nice to them. <laughs> if they expect you just to accept and love and, you know, everybody's going to get along, then use fear. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Lord Jesus demonstrates both of those methods when he deals with people. In John, in chapter 3, you've got Nicodemus. He's hard on Nicodemus. Art thou a, a ruler in Israel and knowest not these things? Who do you think you are? You dare call yourself a master? <laughs> I'm talking about some basics here. What do you mean you don't understand how a person can't be born again? Well, that's mind-blowing. But Jesus ridicules him. That's with fear, pulling him out of the fire. In chapter 4, you've got the, um, the lady taking in, the woman taking in adultery. Okay, there he's got compassion on her. Okay, that's good. There's a time for each. Know which one is which. And the point of each is to effect a change, not you be changed. It's not to change your position so you get along is to use whatever method God has available to you to get them to see God's Word. Look at, uh, okay, that's my introduction. This book is such a big, heavy-duty book, even though it's so tiny. I figured I'd just do it verse by verse because I've not taught through this book verse by verse. And this is one you can actually teach each verse is its own lesson. I... I did the verse by verse from verse 1 down to verse 7, and I'm up to 94 pages. So we're not going to cover all that tonight. <laughs> but I'll just get us started. Jude 1, look at verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Okay, we've seen who the, who the writer is. Of course, that's James uh, the, the, uh, or that's the brother of James. He says right there a word, servant. That's an important word. Second word he uses, Jude the servant, or second phrase. 
That's an important thing to note. You don't have to serve because you're a son. But if you're a good one, you'll serve. God takes note of it. Look at uh, James 1. James 1 verse 1. James, a servant of God. Look at it in chapter 2. James 2 verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. That is, nobody's above serving. Hmm, we should all be his servant. James 3 verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now you notice a word that keeps showing up with this in this same train of thought. Servants, brethren. Brethren, servants. The book we're in is James. That's Jewish. The servants, that word, is connected with the Jew. We're not really servants. That's not our identity. Our identity is sons. There's a nation whose identity is a servant of the Most High God. Look at it in James 5. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. That's, but that's that brethren again. It's talking to a certain race, a certain tribe of people. That's James 5 verse 19. Brethren, if any do err from the truth and one convert him. Look at, uh, let's find another book similar to it. 2 Peter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. There's that servant thing again. And he's talking to his people. Look at it in Revelation 6. Revelation 6 verse 11. These are the souls that are under the altar. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Talking to Jews. They're servants. They died as a servant. Their kinfolk are servants too. And they're going to end up with the same fate. <laughs> Revelation 7. Revelation 7 verse 3. 144,000, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. We know those are all Jews. There's no way around it. <laughs> Revelation 11, 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, as Jews, not Gentiles. I know a lot of Gentiles wanting to be prophets. Sorry. It's all been done. All the prophecies written right here. <laughs> now, Moses and Elijah are going to show up and they may have some momentary prophecy for an individual, but a universal prophecy is already written. It's right here. If they want to give a message, the message is going to be what's been written. Because it's already been told. All the way past when they're going to leave this earth. <laughs> so we're not waiting on them to show up with a message. God's already wrote it. Revelation 22, 9. Then said he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets. And of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Servant, servant. It's always a Jewish connotation in this book. And that's the way Jude begins it because that's who's, who's, who it's aimed at. Is the Jew in the tribulation. Look at Jude uh, verse 2. Jude verse 2. Now think about it. You're in the tribulation. Not, you're not, but put yourself there. <laughs> you're a Jew in the tribulation. 
Somebody's writing you a book that's direct from God, and here's what they have to say. This is really where the message begins, verse 2. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Isn't that going to be an encouraging message for a Jew in the tribulation to receive? Yes. We read it and it just looks like flowery speech. No, it's not flowery speech. When, it, when you can't buy anything and you can't sell anything and everybody is out to get a brownie point for killing you, uh, that'd be a good one to get. Romans 1, look at verse 7. This is nothing new. Every time that the church is persecuted, this becomes an important message. And they're blessed by reading it. Romans 1, 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We've only had two weeks of Biden, and I like the sound of this verse. <laughs> Just wait till the next two years. That verse might have more meaning, won't it? Amen. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, verse 16. When you can't find peace anywhere... This is the place a Christian has the pass that we can go to. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's another good one. If you're in the tribulation, don't you think that verse is going to mean a whole lot? Now, America doesn't really see much tribulation, I understand that, but there's lots of places in this world that are right now. And those verses mean something. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? I hope not, but we'll see. First Peter one. First Peter one verse two. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Now, don't you know that's going to cause somebody with a bad attitude to say, who does he think he's writing to? Can he not see what's going on? There ain't no grace and peace being multiplied. Okay, even there, they're going to have to learn to walk in the Spirit. <laughs> because it won't be apparent. Now, God will step in and give them grace and peace, spiritually. But it won't be physically, because physically it's going to be, literally, hell on earth. Revelation 1. Revelation 1, verse 4. We know Revelation is about the tribulation, or most of it is. Verse 4, John's going to write it. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace, there it is, be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, there's that loved, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Sounds good, unless you're sitting in the tribulation. And you say, I don't feel like no king. I'm getting persecuted by every king. I don't feel like no prince. <laughs> it's going to be spiritual. They're going, it's going to be tough. I'm glad I'm not going to be around for it. <laughs> but they're going to have, that's why it's going to be, the devil's going to have such a crop of Christians, or supposed, you know, followers. Because he's going to make it easy for them to fall in, and he'll make them, he'll crown them a king and a prince. You know, look at, um, we better stop there. If I get into verse 3, it starts getting heavy. We'll begin at verse 3 next week, and we might get verse 3 and 4. <laughs>